everybody here everybody here can hear me for sure it's those out there all right got it all right well good morning everybody welcome to the north dallas plano career focus group it's uh december 22nd 2023 flip over all right so our agenda this morning whoop our agenda this morning we'll start out with success stories which we happen to have a landing, which I'm excited to hear about. Uh, we'll have everybody then give their 30 second introductions. We'll then go to our committee reports. We'll hear about the practice interview team, the interview success workshop. We will hear our career tip of the week. And then we'll have our main event right around the top of the hour, just as time permits. Uh, for those people on Zoom, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please just enter those into the chat window. For those on Facebook, oh, you know what? I didn't, let me call up the Facebook feed here. Let's see, you're going to be. All right, we have one, two people on Facebook right now. All right, uh, for those people on Facebook, if you have any questions, just put those into the comment field. We're monitoring both feeds. We'll be sure to get those questions answered for you. Please note this event is being recorded. It's currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, you give consent for your name and picture to appear. Please note that any comments you put in the Zoom chat window do not appear in the recording. Well, good morning, everybody. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. This group's been around since the late 1990s. I took it over in 2007 when the prior leader landed a job. Uh, in 2008, I saw a need and created a website called careerdfw.org, a website to help those unemployed in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In 2012, I launched a second website, careerusa.org, to help those around the United States. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search That You May Not Know. It is available on Amazon, or if you see me in person, I always have copies with me. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team. You'll hear more about that in just a moment. It's also known as the pit crew. Well, we like to start the meeting off with good news. Anybody out uh, online right now who's got good news to share? Going once, going twice? Well, we have good news to share here. Let me, uh, let me spotlight for everybody so you all can see here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And go ahead. Okay. Um, the name's Eric Gunther, and I, I actually landed or signed an offer letter last Friday with uh, a private government contractor. It's a small company. It's 500 employees. But I'm going to be working for NOAA, which is um, Ocean National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And they do climate change monitoring and monitoring fisheries. So I'm a PL SQL developer. I'll be doing their data handling. Um, but one... I was told to pass on the, some of the things I learned. So I actually took advantage of the pit crew and I learned there, I was talking too much in the interview and then I took advantage of Walt's and Walt's video feedback was real helpful as well as his comments. Um, and one of the things that biggest thing I learned with uh, um, just in December, in fact, it took all the way till December was a lot of the job descriptions I was saying no to, I actually probably met. Um, and what had happened, it turned me around on that was I was talking to a recruiter and I said, hey, this job, I only meet like half this job description. He goes, well, I'm not really understanding the terms. Could you like tell me what you're not meeting? And so I went through his whole job description and I put like red formatted fonts next to it and saying, this is what it, what they're looking for and this is what I meet. And he sent it to the hiring manager and the hiring manager goes, oh, I really like that response. Call this guy in for an interview. And then I, I, I went back with him again. I said, well, you know, it's a good, it's a good opportunity and everything, but it's kind of low pay. And they said, well, we can change that. And they raised it up a little too. So it's kind of cool. It's a remote at home position, um, but they, they compromised a lot. And so I'm happy with where I'm at. And so, so what would you say the mix is, you know, how much do you think you need to qualify? Or how much did you thought you qualified for this job? I thought I had to meet it like, like 70%. And this one I only made, I only met 50%, but I found out why in the interview, I asked him a lot of questions to go, well, look, we're based on the East Coast. We're having a hard time getting people. He said, our skills, it's hard to find somebody with your skill set on the East Coast. He said, they're either demanding a huge amount of money or they'll get through half of our process to find a better position and leave. Um, and he said, so we're having a hard time getting people through all the way. And he says, I want you to commit 
before you accept the offer that you're going to wait for us to process you. I said, sure, I'll commit to that. And that was the big thing there. And committing to the process, was that the security clearance? Yeah, it's a contingent offer based on the security clearance. And I know a lot of people tell me, well, just keep searching because that's not a sure thing. Well, it's actually a sure thing because they put me in for the clearance. I passed their background investigation. They put me in for the clearance and it's very expensive to get a public trust. They wouldn't have done that if they didn't have faith and they weren't going to cancel, I'm pretty sure. Um, and projected uh, start date, I think, is in January. So I got to wait a couple more weeks, but it's worth it, I think. Right. Um, so any other advice for job seekers? Yeah, um, I know a lot of people tell me... It, there, you know, look out for the red flags. And this one had a lot of red flags in it, but I worked through them. So it's not necessarily look out for the red flags, but try to work through them. And I always try, if you have a non-technical recruiter, work with them with the job description. Don't just give up and say, this guy's a mess because mine was, mine was a third party and he was kind of a mess. Um, but I worked through them and that's how I got to the hiring manager and how I actually got the interview. And when I got to the interview, a lot of the stuff I said, you know, I, I don't really have this. He goes, you know, I saw what you said. That's not a big issue. I said, that was just a wish list. And that's what he told me. So, I mean, a lot of people realize that when they go interviewing, but it's, it's actually the fact. I mean, you have to be, you have to get through the hiring manager is the bottom line. No matter what you do, you got to get beyond the recruiter to the hiring manager. For you, even if you said also that you investigated everybody on LinkedIn who you were meeting. Yeah, that's the other thing too. Another tactic I did before the interview is when they sent the interview invite, they got the people's name and domain domain where they're from because a lot of them aren't all necessarily clients. Some are clients, some are customer, and that's how you can tell. Look in the email domain, um, so you can go on LinkedIn and do a search and look at their backgrounds. That helped a lot too because I could I established a rapport with the hiring manager because I knew some of his interests, and so that helps with the interview and how it goes. So that's another recommendation I have. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you for the donuts. Uh, for those of you who are not with us today, we've got uh, two dozen donuts here. Uh, so yeah, a lot of uh, great stuff. Anybody else have good news to share in here, out there, anybody? All right, well, let's move on here. What we want to do now is everybody put their 30 second reductions in the chat window. Uh, so tell us your name, phone number, email address, position you're looking for. Give us two or three target companies. Very, very important target companies, because that's what I'm going to put into a email this afternoon. I'm going to list everybody's target companies. Look over that list, see who you can help, and then open up the roster and give them a call or email and tell them how you can help them. So uh, I will use this also to update our roster for the day. So I'm going to put 30 seconds on the clock. All right, if you're still typing, please feel free to continue typing. We, you know, just like to know you're with us today. We wanna to know how we can do it. There are gonna be some handouts that I will have that goes along with the presentation today. So if I don't know you're with us and I don't have your email address, you're not gonna get the handouts that I'm gonna put out this afternoon along with the email. So if nothing else, give us your email address just so we can uh, do that. Cause I see there's a few new people who I don't recognize names on the uh, list here. All right, uh, let's see here. Next slide. All right, for those people that are here in person, we want to allow them to give their 30 second introduction. So it's all yours. You got the mic. Go. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Knezic. I'm an IT project manager specializing in release management. And I am, my target company is this week is Truck Stop. My name is Mark Knezic. Good morning. My name is Gina Patton. I am interested in working as either a liaison for veterans at a company or even employee engagement or employee training. My target companies are Raytheon and Bell Helicopter. Thank you. I said it at the end. You said it. You want to go too? Good morning. My name is Kelly Lanier. I'm an account manager who wants to just help people onboard or onboard their clients or just have client building relationships to keep the business moving and revenue increasing. 
I'm looking for contacts at FedEx Services and 7-Eleven. My name is Kelly Lanier. Afternoon, my name is Jim Parker. I'm an electrical engineer with extensive experience in sales and marketing, as well as project management. With inside the company, I can work easily across department lines to get things done. Externally at the company, I can speak to any business or technology level to make sure the customer understands the full value of the products and services my company sells. I'm looking for a job at a small to medium-sized company, one with more jobs than people, because I excel at jobs where I wear multiple hats. My name is Jim Parker. Good morning. I'm Jay Mabal. I'm a global operations director who thrives on creating order out of chaos. I have 20 plus years experience in hospitality, healthcare, and SaaS platform companies. I'm looking for a leadership role in service delivery or product implementation here in DFW. I'm Jayma Ball. Uh, two target companies I'm looking for are Rippling and Amadeus. Hi everyone, I'm Drew Puckett. I'm a general partner program manager with a passion for data and business intelligence and analytics and I'm Drew Puckett. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and for those people who just got here, we've got donuts, we've got bagels. So uh, please, you're you're bringing you're bringing down. We're down to like three donuts a piece now with the people who've just gotten here. So thank you for being with us today. All right. Uh, let's see here. Next slide up. Uh, if you know somebody who's unemployed, somebody who's recently unemployed, somebody who's about to be unemployed somebody who's maybe been unemployed for a long time, please let them know about CareerDFW and CareerUSA.org, two totally free websites that are out there. They are just there to help you, the job seeker, or to help a job seeker. So, uh, you know, please let them know. One of the things you'll find on the CareerDFW website is a bunch of calendars. Uh, this is the everything calendar showing everything that's going on, pink or job fairs, blue or uh, networking groups that are meeting in person. Uh, purple or all the uh, webinars and stuff you, you can sign up for. So there's something going on every day of the week. Uh, please check out the calendar to join us. I would say, though, during the holiday period, a lot of groups are not going to be meeting next week. A lot of them didn't meet this week. They may not be meeting the first week of January. So uh, if you're going to go or check, you know, please uh, call, check, verify that they will be meeting before you go. All right, let's talk a second about the practice interview team. Um, your resume, your LinkedIn profile are not going to get you a job. They're going to get you a phone call. How well you practice your interviewing skills, that's what's going to get you your next job. So the Dallas Pit Crew offers totally free interviews. Their motto is practice early, practice often. Because a lot of people just know they don't want to practice, they don't want to try it, and they just wait until they have that real interview. Well, that's not going to work very well. You know, if you can practice a couple times, you will be much better off. I've seen people in the pit crew, when they come and they practice, the first time, it's sort of a mess. But they come back about a month later, they try again. They are much, much better because they've taken to heart what uh, the advice they're given. These interviews are all panel interviews. So you are be interviewed by two or three hiring managers who've done this. They've hired and fired in the past. Uh, all you need to do is send a resume and a job description and your schedule. Uh, they're not scheduling any interviews next week, but for the first week of January, if you're interested, just send your resume and a job description and your schedule that first week of January to DallasPitCrew at gmail.com. Uh, the Pit Crew will be meeting in person uh, starting in January, the first, second, and third week of the month. So every Wednesday, they'll be meeting right here at Christ United Methodist Church in person uh the fourth 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 and if there is a fifth wednesday those will be online but uh we can handle one or two interviews every week i don't know if they've got one scheduled for but i know they're planning to meet on january 3rd so if you'd like to schedule an interview just send your resume to dallaspitcrew.com all right let's hear about the university success workshop good morning walt well good morning everyone and welcome to friday 
three days left to Christmas. You know, one of the best things about the holidays, you hear all the news channels talking about people flying and everybody's going to be on the road and traveling. Well, the good news is that we're going to be with family and being with family is so critical and so important. So I'm grateful for family during the Christmas holidays. Congratulations, Eric. Good job on getting that, getting that, uh, getting past those interviews and, and working through it and working with them. Sounded like you had a good dialogue interview rather than a you know interrogation type style. And so that's our that's our objective in interviewing. So what do I do? I offer the twice totally free interview success workshop. <laughs> and what is that all that about? And how's it different from the pit crew? Well, first of all, it's informal. It, it is a workshop. Yes, you're going to get an interview. We're going to cover 12 basic categories of questions. We're going to talk about approaches, uh, ideas, structures, options, and how we might respond to the question who's asking and when in the process that question appears. When you go into an interview, are you thinking about just answering questions or are you thinking about selling? Because it's a selling situation and we need to learn how to sell ourselves. We can sell somebody else so much easier than we can sell ourselves. I can talk about Jeff and give accolades about all the great things he does. I want to start talking about myself. I'm a little reticent to feel like I'm bragging and that sort of thing. Bragging is just the way you deliver it. Confidence in, in delivery of your abilities and skills and background and how you can help them is not, is not in any way shameful. It's something to be proud of. So what do we sell? I am I do I help ourselves, our current characteristics, our soft skills, our experience, our knowledge, background, history, all that, and then how we combine those for how we can make a difference and how we can help. So how do we sell those things in an interview? And that's what we focus on. And at the same time, another important element is differentiation. How do we differentiate ourselves from other interviews? Probably everyone who gets to the interview stage past the screening stage can do the job. So how do we differentiate ourselves? So we focus on that as well. Very informal. It is a workshop. You will get a recording of your interview. We will talk and discuss how we can improve ourselves. Not everybody's doing a pretty good job these days, but there's some ways in, that we can change and just tweak a little bit and keep that selling mindset in place for a really successful interview. The definition of a successful interview is one where you have done a great job in selling who you are, what you do, and how you can help. It might not mean an offer, it might not be a fit, but if you've done a good job doing that, that's all that we can do. So come on down, look me up on LinkedIn, send me an email and I'll get you registered for the workshop. Well, tomorrow I'll start my vacation, so I make this proclamation. If while gone you get a job and your presence from us you rob, send a note so we can share in celebration. Walt, thank you very, very much. I don't know why I didn't have the poetry slide up here for you. Sorry about that. I had to quickly go get it. All right. Uh, every week, there's a brand new career tip of the week on the Career DFW calendar uh, on the career, on the websites. Um, I've been doing this since 2000. There's been a new tip of the week every Saturday afternoon since uh, 2009. Rosanna is with us this morning, and she's going to read this week's tip of the week. Good morning, Jeff, and good morning, everybody. Ooh, we are already here. The, the kickoff of the last... Um, Holiday, Christmas and New Year holidays. So time has flown this year. Well, as we're entering the fast and furious interview stages where we can get jobs and offers in this last couple of weeks, there is a good, this is a great tip of the week. So it's dated December the, excuse me, December 17th, 2023. And the question is, are multiple job interview rounds really necessary? Well, this article is by Ching Chingi Lin. How companies can simplify the process without compromising their evaluation of candidates. While it's critical for companies to thoroughly assess potential hires, the length of the job process seems to be increasing. 
On LinkedIn, you'll find numerous stories of candidates undergoing anything from nine to 12 rounds of interviews in their quest to secure a role, only for their application to be unsuccessful. The time it takes for an organization to make a new hire has reached an all-time high, as reported by human capital advisory firm, the Josh Burschen uh, Company and Global Talent Solutions Business. Um, beyond unfavorable macro conditions, beyond a firm's direct control, much of the culpability for drawn out cumbersome interview processes falls on the companies themselves. A prolonged process, say one that stretches over two months from start to finish, doesn't just cause psychological stress for candidates, but also has practical implications for firms. Vacant roles remain unfilled, which can be a drain on both time and resources. Candidates can become frustrated and withdraw their application, causing the company to lose out on a good hire. One reason for conducting so many interviews could be that the firms are just not adequately prepared when they begin the hiring process. A lack of internal alignment and entangled politics increase the complexity and, slow, and that slows things down. <clears throat> Leaner headcounts, especially in HR departments due to recent layoffs, could also mean that individuals without the proper knowledge of how to interview candidates are being asked to step up without sufficient preparation. Inefficient stakeholder management could also be at play. Some firms require multiple ind individuals to meet and sign off on a hiring decision, which may be advantageous for reasons of equity and diversity, but this can prolong things if too many people with similar profiles are involved. There is also immense cost and performance pressure to hire the right candidate, one that can execute the role, is an organizational fit, and will remain in the firm for at least a year or ideally longer. Hiring managers and HR executives could therefore feel the, feel the need to put a candidate through the ringer to ensure they are making the right choice. Well, there are several topics here, and we're going to cover a few. Few. One is job interviews have fundamentally changed. <clears throat> Before making procedural tweaks, companies must re reconsider old perspectives to interview interviewing candidates. In a program I recently ran at C-suite executives, I asked them to raise their hand if they thought that the job interview process had changed. Almost every raised hand was still, excuse me, almost everyone raised their hand while shaking their head. It seemed apparent to them that the purpose and dynamics have evolved in the past few years. Indeed, job interviews have fundamentally shifted from one-way assessment to a two-way conversation. Traditional interviews are mostly about fitting candidates, skills, and experiences into a box on an organizational chart. Companies hold most of the power and the candidates need to sell themselves to secure the job. Elements are, of this is still exist in today's job interviews, but these have become more of a dialogue with the aim of arriving at a mutually beneficial outcome. Candidates also assessing whether an organization, including its approach to the interview process, is the right cultural fit offers a platform for them to make an impact and will allow them to progress in their careers. To tailor job interviews to suit this new reality, firms should focus on finding a culture and purpose fit for both sides instead of spending countless rounds just assessing hard skills. Interviewers also need to get ready for the pitch, the organization to the, organ to the candidate, connect them with connect them through personal anecdotes and ask the right questions to craft a development plan that suits that individual. Next, we wanna also talk about making the interview process more efficient. How can the interview process be made less painful for all involved while still ensuring a holistic and comprehensive evaluation of the candidate? 
attempting to shorten the process by, by conducting multiple back-to-back -back interviews on a single day presents logistical challenges and can have, can have several disadvantages. The intensity and high stakes nature of this approach may, be, may put undue pressure on the candidate to perform and results in organizations making hasty um, hiring decisions. It may risk catching both sides on a bad day. Instead, organizations can focus on better preparation for interviewing potential hires. And just like they expect candidates to do, employers should be putting their best foot forward when they embark on interviews. Internal alignment from all stakeholders needs to be established early and should cover the evaluation criteria, delegation of roles and in interview form format. The candidate should be able to meet with a diverse range of individuals from within the firm to avoid biased evaluations. This can help with attaining clarity and decisiveness, which could be shortening the interview process. Related company, relatedly, companies uh, need to send the right personnel to evaluate candidates. Not everyone within an organization is adept at interviewing or trained to conduct interviews well. Firms must therefore devote the proper resources toward building this up as a unique capability. Agreement on the appropriate number of interview rounds and standardizing the process are also key. For instance, Google's, Google's People's Analytics team examined interview data and determined that having four interviews was sufficient to make a reliable hiring decision. Implementing this reduced implementing this reduced their average time to hire by roughly two weeks. Firms should also think about beyond the conventional one-on-one -on -one in-person interview format. Group and panel interviews, casual chats over lunch, and structured office visits where candidates interact with potential uh, future colleagues can offer different perspectives. These may also help companies arrive at a decision quicker. Remote interview tech, interviewing techniques, including having a rec, um, including having a candidate's record of a video to introduce themselves, or doing video interviews, can also be used as a baseline for technical assessments. This can help alleviate scheduling and cost issues, enabling companies to make faster hires across a, a range of markets. And however, for most firms, I could caution against hiring people solely based on remote interviews. A remote setup makes it hard for both sides to gauge the culture and organizational fit. It should thus be supplemented by one on-site visit or an in-person conversation during later rounds. Adopting a holistic approach to the process can make it more efficient and, efficient and effective and it can ensure that the time spent interviewing is purposeful and empower a company to hire people that will not only perform well, but also move the organization forward. Again, this article is dated December the 17th, and it is, are multiple job interview rounds really necessary? For all these people, all of you guys who have landed or will land, please keep in mind this whole interview process that you've gone through and the job search journey that you've encountered. And please make a difference for those on the outside because now you're going to be on the inside. Have a fantastic weekend. Very, very Merry Christmas and safe ho holiday travels. Rosanna, thank you very much. Yeah, when I saw this article, I said, yes, I wish every HR person would read this. Every hiring manager, you don't need to have so many I remember there was a story once, uh, Dennis O'Hagan, the late Dennis O'Hagan, who ran the DFW sales group, used to tell a story. He got interviewed 11 times by a company. And on the 12th time, he said, if y'all can't make a decision, I'm not working here. I'm gone. And he didn't, he just stopped. He said it wasn't worth going. You know, he was having fun. Interview number eight, nine, 10, 11 was sort of fun. At this point, he was just trying to see how long he could drag it out. But he was like, I am... There is no way I'd ever hire because if you can't make a decision, if a company can't make a decision in four interviews, 
what does that say about the company? I think that really has a lot to say about a company. So Rosanna, thank you very, very much. And we'll see you, uh, we'll hear from you next year. All right, uh, today for lunch, come join us today at lunch. We're gonna go to Jason's Deli. Uh, they've got everything, sandwiches, great soup, uh, uh, salad bar, everything. Come join us, 4801 West Parker Road, uh, northeast corner of Parker and Preston. So join us today at 1145. Coming up in just a couple of moments, we're going to hear from Dr. Glenn Earl talking about the job search scorecard. And I just want to mention that the upcoming next week, we will not have a session. So uh, we'll take it. We're only taking off one Friday this year. I didn't know if we'd take off this Friday, but well, we've got everybody here today. This is great. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, otherwise, I'd be sitting at home reading the newspaper. Huh? Yes, because you helped you help vote. Yes. So that's why we're here today. Uh, and then we'll be back together on January 5th. We'll do open forum. We'll answer whatever questions you have. And uh, we will also answer, ask everybody the question, what was their favorite Christmas gift that they got this year? So uh, be ready with that when you come back on January 5th. All right, it's time for our main event. Uh, I've known Glenn for many, many years. He was part of this group. Uh, he, he used to live real close here, and then he moved out to, D out to the uh, West Coast, and he's now recently back here now. He's now a uh, professor at UT Arlington. Um, he'll tell you a little bit about his background. This is a pre-recorded session from last year when he did the presentation when he was still living in, in uh, Seattle. Uh, but Glenn's been part of this group a couple times when he was unemployed, uh, and he came up with this scorecard because he found people were sometimes doing things. He found he was doing things it wasn't very effective. And so he went and assigned points to things. Um, so his presentation was like 35, 40 minutes. And then there's some discussion afterwards of some other things that maybe should be added in. So um, I will send out his, I will send this out to everybody this afternoon in the roster. Uh, so you can get the attachment and then feel free to modify it however you want. If you, if there's something else you'd like to add, you're welcome to do so. So let me switch to Glenn here. I um, just want to double check that uh, you can uh, hear and see me all right. We can. There we all go. Right. Good. Um, okay, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So um, my entire career has been in uh, leadership and organization development uh, with various and sundry uh, organizations. I lived in Dallas for 15 years and uh, was actually were well, your city three different times in those 15 years. So uh, I've come to love this organization. Uh, it, it has uh, does great work. And on a personal level, it has helped me tremendously in my career. So you can look at uh, some of the uh, organizations I work with. Uh, the biggest one and the longest one is when I worked at Parkland Hospital uh, doing leadership and organization development there. Okay, next. So I want to talk a little bit about the background of the uh, job uh, search scorecard. So I created this, you know, a decade and a half ago for my own benefit. And basically it was I wanted and needed to have some parameters, some boundaries about this job search. Because as you know, uh, job search is mentally and physically and emotionally exhausting. And I wanted to put some, you know, protective self-care measures in what I did. So I created this and, over, and I, I made a point system that you can do on a daily basis and a weekly basis. And I'll talk more about that as we move along. So basically the why of the point, point uh, ration, rationale. So the way that I set it up, after what I consider to be lengthy and exhaustive research, because I'm the one that did it, um, about how people actually make, uh, actually land the job as opposed to the time it takes to complete an activity. Next. So some of the rationale is whomever you believe, about three to 10% of jobs are found through an internet search, either through um, a job board like LinkedIn or a company website. So down there, you can see the uh, statistics of what it's like. Five to 10% of people get a job through the internet. 
10 to 15 percent is through recruiters they contact you either out of the blue or you may have sent something but and 75 80 percent of jobs that anyone will ever land in corporate america large corporations small corporations will be through their personal networking hence an internet activity that you do i purposely designed so you get very few points and networking is you get significantly more points, uh, like I said, because 80% of the jobs are found through networking. All the others combined, and there's five or six other major areas, you know, uh, internet, re research, uh, job board, uh, you hear about it, all of those things add up to only about 20% about someone gets a job in, in America. And uh, the vast majority is through what you're doing now, you're interacting with people. So the rationale is to get out there and interact. So using this job uh, scorecard as, as your roadmap and your guide is designed to literally force a person, and sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to do, sometimes it's challenging to do, to get out there and, and get away from the computer and start interacting with people. And I have found, uh, so here's the job, go ahead, here's the job scorecard. So, you know, you, you do it for a week, how many points, what's the activity, and then you have a daily goal, uh, a weekly goal, and if you achieved it or not. Next. So here's some ways that you get one point. So these are many. Uh, you do an internet uh, submitted, and like was talked about today, uh, a lot of these organizations, they have massive amounts of uh, organizations, or excuse me, applicants, the vast majority are not qualified, vast majority of the human will never see. It's done through, uh, you know, an algorithm bot that does it. So, and a lot of organizations, if you're actively involved with this, you know this, now they have what's called easy apply, they like to use LinkedIn, they have easy apply. Basically you push like four or five buttons. Here's my resume, you know, uh, here's my ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. So you can literally apply to dozens of jobs within a half hour using easy apply. They always take a little bit longer. So here's some of the points. You uh, submit a regular interview uh, resume. You add a, an, an additional point is if you had a standard cover letter. And some people, you know, there's a fair amount of discussion still. And when I say still, it's kind of a biased assessment. The research, and experience is the vast majority of organizations don't look at cover letters. If they do look at cover letters, they don't give it much thought or much uh, reasoning if they're going to use it or not. And so, most organizations today don't require, require a cover letter, but some do. So if you write that. Another point for uh, uh, reviewing a company website then you get a third point, you review jobs on three internet. So if you just look at a job, that's a, like a third of a point. So once again, it's designed, just you know, scrolling through your internet uh, isn't very worthwhile in terms of points and activities and getting you a job. So two points. One measure is a customized resume. Some people um, talk, you know, comment that it's very important, others say it's less so. My belief and impression is as best as you can, I would customize every resume. Now, when I say customize, it doesn't mean you write an entire new resume. What you do is you highlight certain areas, give them more prominence, so an algorithm or a recruiter would look at that. So it's adjustments, you know, if they uh, want some sort of activity uh, that you have, but it's not current, like so you did it 10 years ago, somewhere in your resume, you want to highlight that critical key, like maybe at the top, uh, so uh, it can easily be found. And then there's the uh, customized T letter. You may or may not be familiar with this. A T, uh, T uh, cover letter is, on one side, you literally write the qualifications the activities and stuff that the company is requiring of this position. Then on the right side, 
of the T of, of a sheet of paper, you write your response of, you know, they ask for 10 years experience and a bachelor's degree. So you highlight that. Here's my 10 years experience and here's my bachelor's degree. They say, uh, good interpersonal communications. And you'd say, here's how I demonstrate good interpersonal communications. So that's a, a customized T letter. Um, personally, I think they're very valuable. They take a lot of time. So um, you may want to judicially decide where and how you want to use them. However, I believe if you're going to write a cover letter, the only worthwhile cover letter is a T cover letter. Then the, the folks will uh, more likely read it because you're really highlighting sorts of things that they're highlighting. Like, and, and I would say, you know, a T cover letter is about is one page. So you're going to maybe write five or six things on there is all. Uh, you know, not, it's not exhaustive. And you're highlighting the most important things that they're looking for. So uh, I would uh, invite you to strongly consider this as, a, as, as an option. Um, like I said, sometimes it's available to do it, sometimes it's not. You know, on, on, on those easy apply, all you do is push your resume and that's it. So you wouldn't necessarily write there, write one for that. Well, and before I jump on, I just thought I'd add a little comment here about the uh, customized Please. resume. The easiest way to probably do that is create a master resume, a re resume that's done everything that has everything you've ever done over the since you graduated, you know, college or whatever, and you put everything together. And when we talk about customizing resume, it's eliminating everything that they don't ask about in a job description. That way, you don't have to sit there and think about wait. You know, I think I did that 15 years ago. You've already got written down. And it's easy to just go and delete things off of a Word document. So that may be a simple way to come up with a customized resume. Absolutely. Um, I have that. Uh, it's seven pages long. And uh, so when I customize a resume or have in the past, I pay poignant parts that the organization was looking for out of that seven pages. Right. Good. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Next. Here's all the things about for a, a three point. Complete an e-interview. And that was talked about today, where you're asked to respond either verbally, and I've done that before in the past, is you're literally looking at a screen, up pops a question, and you provide an audio, they can see you, and an audio of the response to that question. Um, there's... Uh, and, and like was mentioned early, uh, these sorts of things are, are now becoming a, a concern and I'm not gonna get into that. However, there's another way that's more common that still one needs to do. And that is sometimes they have uh, an e-interview. And basically they said, we looked at your resume, you're interested, you know, please respond to these questions. Or it could be in the very application of the resume or, or in the um, application is that, there'll be a, a writing a question. Now, my field is leadership and organization development. This type of e-interview, where on the interview process that you add with your resume, they'll ask five or six questions. In my experience, that's very common. So that's gonna be based industry and profession-based about whether they do that. Like I said, in my industry, it's real common and is expected. Yours may be the same. Also be prepared for that, so we want to give yourself three points for that because you know that takes you know could take anywhere from you know 15 minutes to an hour to, to to create that, and then make a general networking call. And once again, oftentimes uh, my premise is making the call is absolutely critical. And there's something called call reluctance. It's sometimes all of us don't like to make a phone call. So I you want to give yourself credit and the pat on the back. We're actually making the call regardless of whether you talk to someone or not. And in this day and age, it's highly unlikely you're going to call and they'll pick up the phone and you, you know, you're there. So I would suggest, what I suggest is make the call. Even if it's a recording, give yourself some credit because you're extending yourself out to the probably in an additional way. So um, this is important to me. Um, because this is my professional assessment, and this includes myself along with you and everyone else. I, and now remember, I'm a psychologist. 
I believe at some point in time, everyone, and I mean everyone, who goes through a job search at some point or a moment in time, they are clinically depressed. The vast majority of the time, you're just kind of depressed and, and woe is me and I don't feel like doing things. And that's natural and normal. Everyone does that. And I believe sometimes, you know, after you go weeks and lots of rejections, you don't hear anything, we become clinically depressed. And and I'm not saying it, that's true. And I, I don't think you need to, you don't see a therapist, you don't take medication. You just get actively involved and out in the world and that will help. So this is why it's important to in network informally. And what it is, is you just have, you know, you meet at Starbucks for a coffee, uh, you go to lunch, just to get out and interact with people, that's critically important at this point, even if it has nothing to do with your job search. Now, during the course of your conversation, you absolutely want to talk about your job search. The most important thing is you're out with another human being away from your home and having interaction. Thanks, next. So five points, you, one is attend a nev, uh, formal networking. So you uh, coming today, whether in person or Zoom, you're out attending an organized, like what you're doing now, that's a formal. So it's you get more points because you're out of the house. And then you email a general resume with or without a cover letter to the hiring manager or recruiter. So it's not some um, uh, application that you just send out into the uh, meta universe. You actually have the person's name and email address and you just either, either it's a follow-up or uh, initiation hello. And if you're not, I would encourage you to be actively and strongly involved in LinkedIn. And when you apply for a job on LinkedIn, they will give you Who's the recruiter for that? Oftentimes, the recruiter, most times it's like a second level uh, connection, which means you still have the ability to send a note. So I would uh, uh, highly encourage you to consider that yeah. because now you're actually talking to a real person about a real job and it's not going through uh, you know, their recruiting uh, website or anything like that. Then you, or then the next ones you conduct a telephone informational interview. This is on your LinkedIn or just a friend that you know through your religious organization or where you used to work or something like that is you call them up, you contact them. So just making a phone call, you get five points. So the informational interview is done over the phone. So you talk to someone and say, you might have, uh, we have a, a phone call for uh, 10 minutes. I knew you used to work at uh, Euler Packard. I'm, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I wanna be a technical manager there. Would you be willing to uh, 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 fill some questions for me? Critically important, because now you're gonna talk about a human being over the phone. So five points for that. So seven points, you conduct an in-person informational interview. Now the reality is a lot of people don't have time to feel, you know, go out to lunch or a coffee or, you know, a soda. So sometimes uh, in person is, is kind of challenging to even set up. But doing that is important. Next, if you actually call a hiring manager recruiter, whether you speak with them or not, you left a message. That's important because now you're reaching out to a specific human being. And that you email a customized resume and a customized key letter to the hiring manager recruiter. So that third one is gonna take some time. And though you're not interacting personally and live, it's still critically important. And now you're at, you know, interacting one-to-one -one with a real human being. And it's not a general resume, it's specifically that position and a customized key letter. All right, 10 points. Basically it's a dossier, dossier uh, or a brag binder. So literally you, create a binder and in the old days physically I would give them people when I did an interview when I was in Dallas I would make one put it in a binder and hand it to people at the beginning of the res uh, the interview 
Now, sometimes it may be associated with an interview, maybe not. However, I would consider you doing this. And once again, like Jeff said, you know, you'll have files, you know, in your Word document, and you can just cut and paste and pick and choose specific ones. But you're talking about the awards you won, um, special recognition, play of the month. Like as an example, when I worked at Parkland, we created a, a, a dynamic leadership development program that won five uh, ATD associate, associations of trainers and developers. That's like the gold standard of our organization, ATD. That leadership development program won five awards. So believe me, anytime I talk to, still today, anytime I talk to someone about what it is, I say, I was involved in award-winning leadership program. Hundreds and thousands of people make leadership development program, but not many of them are award-winning. So that's something that you would highlight. So it takes some time, but I tell you, my experience are dynamite. They're, it's, it's, I think I consider it gold. So I would invite you to consider this is a way to go. Maybe you don't do it with all. And when you're doing like an interview or something, you won't have the opportunity. You don't need to. So you only want to do this at a point in the interview process or the hiring recruiting process when you're getting ready for a um, interview or perhaps you have some sort of conversation with a recruiter. And once again, I'm going to use the example of LinkedIn. You know, you could just attach that and send it to them. So I would uh, invite you to, this is, in my estimation, is very, very powerful. So once again, a telephone interview. In this day and age, absolutely almost everyone, I don't care what the job is, what organization, you're going to conduct an in a, a telephone interview. And it, it's almost always by the recruiter. And the reality of those is they're kind of knockout. So here's, here's a couple of things I want to say about the resume and, and how you show up in your, uh, uh, to have an interview. So I've been in this field for 30 years and I know lots of recruiters and I've recruited. Here's the reality. I had a good friend in Dallas at the time, uh, I worked at Parkland. She worked at a uh, health, um, I can't remember the name, but it was another healthcare, HCA. And she was a recruiter for the technical. They're clinical, but they're not uh, patient facing. They may be like a lab tech. That was what who, the type of person she recruited for HCA. She says, I look at the resume, I look at the top half of it, I don't look at any of the rest of it. Because I've got hundreds. She would have 700, 800 applications. So how do you go through that? You know, it's just long and laborious. Even if the algorithm does it. So then after that, you know, they're going to have 30 uh, resumes that they look at. Then they're going to have about 15 uh, phone calls. And they're like 15, 20 minutes now. Then you'll have a telephone or a, or a Zoom uh, interview after that. And the last is absolutely, you know, the uh, mother load is that you get 24 points for an in-person interview. Next. There's a job scorecard again. How much work do you do every day? And how many points? For me, I made a goal. This was kind of arbitrary, but it had some rationale behind it for me. Is you want to make earn 20 to 30 points every day. However, I had a friend who wanted to get 50 points a day because the type of job he wanted wasn't on the internet. You know, there wasn't any LinkedIn. So he had to do, and he had to do a lot of research and he wanted to work for a bilingual uh, medium-sized company. So you have to decide. So, What's the right number for you? Reasonable and challenging. If you can easily meet your target in a few hours, raise it. If you have a target that you never meet, that's destructive. You want to lower it. You can lower it in good faith. Maybe it's only 20. Maybe it's 30. But you'll kind of come up with a number that... So the range, 
Sometimes in the day, I did three. Sometimes I did 70. That 70 was all networking. I didn't have an interview. I was just busy out all the time. So you want to earn between 25 and 30 points, four to five days. The fifth day, somewhere between 10 and 50 points. And I'll tell you why that uh, fifth day is lower. I believe you only ought to spend 32 hours a week on your job. Hunt. As you know, searching for a job is a full-time job. And so you don't want to do 50, you don't want to do 60, you don't want to do 20, you don't want to do 10. You ought to spend somewhere, somehow, six, seven, eight hours a day looking for a job. Once again, with the scorecard, there's several significantly wide variety of things that you can do. And I highly recommend is that in that work week of Monday through fr uh, Friday, I highly encourage you to spend four hours a half a day. It would be broken up in one four-hour segments, two uh, two-hour segments. However, it's critical from a psychological, emotional, and per a physical reason why you want to do this. This is it. The reality is, even though you are under significant amount of stress of being unemployed. There's people out in this world who are significantly have more problems and more issues than you have. And part of that going out is you are just serving others. Partly is you're gonna easily recognize that, wow, my life's pretty good even though I'm unemployed. And so giving to the community, and that can be any type of organization. You wanna make it formal, uh, attached to an organization um, as opposed to just going, going out and mowing someone lawn, someone's lawn, well, that's valuable. So if they find nonprofit organizations who can use volunteers, they're all over the DFW area and just give some time to give back to others because uh, it helps, it's good for your, good for your soul, it's good for your mind. And those pe people benefit. Next is, and that week, four hours a week, you want to give yourself a reward. You're playing, you're having fun, you're not uh, on the job hunt. So when I was looking for a job, Monday through Thursday, six, eight hours a day, Friday, a couple hours in the morning, and Friday afternoon was my reward time, my happy time. I love movies. I'd say about 80% of the time, I would go see movies on Friday afternoon. Uh, so whatever is fun and exciting, relaxing for you, you want to do, it's special, because you did a great job, you want to reward yourself. That's critically important that you reward yourself. Rewards and boundaries. We talked about the words, we talked about the boundaries. Job hunting is tough, tough and lonely, long hours, and you have to maintain your psychological and your emotional reserve and resolve. You have to keep that, continue looking for a job. Because in this day and age, the, the, the hunt, job hunting process, regardless of what the you read in your newspaper, there are jobs all over, there are. It can take weeks and it can take months. As an example, what I do for a living, a normal unemployment time is six months. And when I was... Uh, there in DFW, it was unemployed for three times. The shortest time was three months. The longest time was six months. I know that. And that's why part of this was built. That's why, why you have to keep your emotional and, and your physical mental state healthy enough to keep going to what I call that hard slog. So psychologically, the higher number is more important than the lower one. You want to set a limit on yourself. But when you want to say, I've done all I need to do today and I can stop. And you in good faith, without guilt or stress, can stop job hunting for the day. So it's imperative that you set boundaries. Otherwise, you'll be constantly looking for a job 24 7, never having a beginning, never having an end, and you will wear yourself down physically, mentally, and emotional. And then your effectiveness in job hunting 
takes a steep nosedive that just almost craters. So part of this process is that self-care of how you're able to take care of yourself through this job hunting process. That's why the job scorecard, because you can do something in the day and say, I've done it, I fulfilled that day, I want to get 20 points, but now I can move on, I can stop, I can go do what things, I can clean the house or whatever. Just, yeah, just kind of a wrap up comment is that it's challenging, it's stressful, you want to take good care of yourself. And I found using this job scorecard was a good way for me to one, get out there every day and do something, have some accomplishments and achievements. And two, it guided me to stop at some point in time. Because and one of the things that I I I held for myself and I would recommend for you is absolutely do not do any job hunting on Saturday and Sunday. You have to have the time to recover, recruit, be with your family, attend a religious organization, just having fun, uh, having a beer with your buddies, something. So I would highly encourage absolutely no job hunting on Saturday and Sunday. And Friday, or another day that works better for you, you only work a half a day and, and the rest of it is spent playing as a reward to yourself. So in essence, uh, that's it. I appreciate the opportunity. I wish you the best uh, in uh, landing uh, your new uh, great job. Thank you. Glenn, thank you. If anybody has any questions, you're welcome to unmute your mic or uh, ask and we'll questions. All right, hold on. We got two couple questions here. Sure. Dr. Earl, one of the things that I've, and I've been involved with uh, this group and several other search groups in town, I participate in the pit crew doing practice interviews. My personal opinion is the pit crew or doing practice interviews is an extremely important tool because it's the one thing that can actually get you a job. Absolutely. Uh, so I might have missed it, but I didn't see practice interviewing in your list of scores. And I think it's so important because I have done some coaching in some of these groups. And the hardest thing uh, I've always uh had is getting people to agree to do the first practice interview. Not only that, but getting them to do follow-up practice interviews, because it takes at least three and probably five, you know, because, you know, what they'll tell you is, hey, I, I learned, you guys told me everything I need to do to fix my interview. Well, if you don't do it again, you don't know if you really fix it. Mm -hmm. So practice interviewing is, in my opinion, a key and would love to see it rewarded. Uh, the more you do, the more points you get kind of situation. Absolutely. I agree with you. I appreciate you bringing it up. Jeff and I are going to change, uh, change the scorecard. So it takes... Um, you have, to tell me, you have to tell me where you, where you want to assign those points at. You know, it's sort of interesting. I was just thinking about this. Back in 2007, 2008, when you put this together, we didn't have the practice interview team because that only started like six or seven years ago. So that's another whole area that we've never even investigated, but is a really good suggestion. So you're going to have to let me know where you want to assign those points sure. at. Just on a personal note, I have found that when I had practice interviews, the real interviews went significantly better. And, and I think it's a brilliant idea. And uh, let me go back and do a little homework uh, and revision. And uh, I'm going to put the practice interview highlighted. I'm thinking, you know, uh, at, at, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 points. And I agree with you. Um, I don't know how many you need to do. You need to do one and you need to do two and probably three. Right. And, right. Yeah, I agree with you. I appreciate you pointing that out. And I'm going to make some adjustments and uh, change it. Thank you. And we will get this list out to everybody who's uh, on the call today. So as long as I have your email address, we will give you a copy of this presentation. But you're going to have to wait now until we uh, add this other thing. So we have another question here. Yes. Hello there. Uh, Hello. To, just tacking on to your comment about actually getting you the job, I wanted to understand from you a little bit better about how to strategically set up uh, in, informational interviews or that um, interviewing time where you're collaborating with others. Because mm -hmm. what I found um, 
It's helpful for camaraderie to connect with other job seekers, mm -hmm. but it may not necessarily lend to getting informational interviews and spending my time with companies or people that are influencers or hiring managers or know those individuals. So what's the difference in scale there in terms of time investment? I appreciate that. I'm gonna say this in a kind loving way. So when I talk about informational interviews, for me, it's always with people in an organization that's already employed. So to me, an informational interview is someone who is employed, someone who's worked at the company, someone who now works at the company. And that is designed to just get a better awareness of that. And uh, certainly I, I appreciate your uh, feedback and that's something I can refine and highlight a little bit better of what actually entails a informational inter interview. Once again, whether it's over the phone or in person, an informational interview is designed for a certain thing, which is to get literally more information about the job that you're seeking or in general or with a specific company, the people you interact and contact with have some connection to that organization. I used to work there. I work there now. Uh, so I'll, I'll refine and emphasize that more about what that entails and who it's designed. So just going out and talking with a buddy, there's points for that. However, that's not an informational interview. So I appreciate the feedback and I'll uh, refine that. Also, thank you. So, uh, Dr. O. Mike Warner again. Uh, I have uh, uh, two other things that I've noticed in the process. One is you got to be careful uh, about attending meetings like this one here because uh, I've been involved enough times to see the same faces showing up at multiple different meetings to the point where it kind of becomes a crutch and it's good to get out of the house and socialize with people but sometimes I fear and this is based on having done some coaching and talking to people that they're really not using the meetings to uh, they they hear things but then they don't implement and they pretty much are attending the meetings just to get out of the house which isn't bad but I think when we're talking about rewarding points, you know, after a while, attending the meetings, uh, I think, loses its value. Um, I agree with you. Here's what I did for myself. I was involved with three professional groups. So I would encourage anyone to limit themselves about how, much, how many of these organizations, net, uh, job networking groups, that you're actually a member of, that you actually attend. So I always did um, this one here. Uh, then there was one about uh, that was specific to my industry and field. So those two, I would attend on a regular basis. And once in a while, there would be another one I'd do, but that was kind of a one-off. So I was really a member of two networking groups, the general one, which you folks are involved with, which I think is critically important. I learned lots of things. Someone, someone has nothing to do with my industry or field or profession. That's critically important. Uh, important. Then I would invite you to choose one that's specifically for your field. Like I knew there was one there was like on sales and marketing, and there are some others. So having two that you regularly attend, I think is very important. And I agree. You can attend these over and over and all week long, and that's all you do, and that's wonderful and good. However, it doesn't really help you if you're not doing anything based on your experience there. So certainly I can kind of refine that and say in the point system, it would be attending you know, a networking group and here's the sorts of things that you need to do. So one, just attend it. Two is if you do these three or four things, that's an additional. So it gives uh, what I would do, and I appreciate your feedback, would design in such a way that when they attend that networking meeting, they actually have to do things and accomplish something. So I'll, I'll figure that out. And I appreciate the feedback. So I, I appreciate your presentation. Uh, I actually asked Jeff uh, about 
because I, I know uh, the scorecard had helped me out in some cases, and I asked Jeff about it after our meeting last week, so it's great to see you <laughs> here so quickly. Uh, and the other thing, you know, you use the uh, sheet not just to give you a, uh, information, it's your accountability partner to, to a large degree. Then that's the other thing I didn't hear talked about that I think next to uh, practicing uh, interviewing, I think the next most important thing is participating in uh, an accountability group. I think that deserves uh, extra points uh, because I found those to be so valuable if they're run the right way. And Jeff knows that we used to have one with Walt Glass that, uh, that worked uh, and we kept the number down to uh, seven or eight people max because right. the whole purpose was to give everybody a chance to spend time telling, confessing what they did or didn't do. And then the other people, you know, asking, not pointing the finger, but asking the right kinds of questions to make them realize that they needed to either do more or change this habit or that they were giving them a pat on the back, that they were doing a great job. So I, I really love uh, the accountability group as a tool in this whole process. And, you know, you got to pick people who maybe aren't your friends, people you know who are a little bit uh, upfront and terse because that's what you need. You don't need more people at home and at church, you got people patting you on the back, telling you everything's going to be okay. What you need in your accountability group is people that are going to kick you in the butt when you need it. So, uh, thank you. I appreciate that, and I, I can refine that. So, my experience with account uh, accountability, the scorecard is actually, you know, I think really good at self accountability. And the way that I mostly work it for me in my professional life is I have accountability partner. So that's another way is. So how do you hold you know, the accountability? So there's self-accountability scorecard. Then another way is with other people. One is um, have accountability partner, which is just you and another person. And then you have accountability group. And I will add this accountability into the scorecard. And it can be just a partner uh, and it can be um, uh, a small group. And to me, a small group is, uh, you know, I would say it's a, you know, I'm just thinking in my head, and it's just, just my own thought. You know, maybe you know five people. And you don't want two or three because then it doesn't work so well. Uh, then if you have you know more than eight, then it's like an unwieldy and doesn't work well either. So, and in the, to me, those are self-forming, self-designed. Is that four or five people get together, and this is just my take for those who have a significant other. Absolutely, never have your significant other as your accountability partner. It's a hard slog and there's all sorts of uh, relationship issues and money issues that come up. So uh, please do not have your significant other uh, as an accountability partner, get someone else. So that's just my take on it. So I'll add that, I appreciate the feedback. We have a whole presentation about accountability partners uh, up on the Career USA YouTube channel. If you want more information on how to form an accountability group, please reach out to me. I've got all that information. I can get it to you. Uh, any questions online? Anybody on Zoom have a question? You're welcome to unmute your mic. Walt, I see you've unmuted your mic. Yeah, thanks very much for your thoughts and ideas and for the analytical and it's love spreadsheets and points and things like that. This can definitely help us measure productivity and the success along the way so that we can celebrate those. It's not just getting a job as the one final measurement. Well, the thought that I'm having is, is the value of the activities that you do. And so while there is value in doing an activity, if like for an informational interview, you do not have an objective, you do not have like a requirement that says, I know I want to learn about A, B, or C, I want to make two more connections. And so if you're reaching the value and the purpose and the objective of those activities, that's going to be worth points as well. Just mm -hmm. talking to someone is one thing, and, but talking with the value. So if you attend a meeting like today, what did you learn from today? What was the value of attending today's meeting? What did you learn from it? What activity or action will you take as a result of this meeting today? 
and you can reward yourself for actually, you know, it's not just participating that gets us points, it's the value of the participation. I like that because I I absolutely believe showing up out in the world is critically important. Second is I can make the adjustments that, okay, now that you're there, what are two or three things that you're going to do as a result of that? Like you said, like with this group, something says, you know, I'm looking for a contact in ABC company. Well, that's above and beyond just attending. Now you're talking with uh, Floyd or Jane. They said, hey, I used to work there. Uh, here's what I know about the company. So I like that, that an, an additional level of accountability, productivity, and value is that you have some type of goal or something you want to achieve at that activity and that you go out and do that. Like now that I have a phone number of the company, now I'm going to call them. So I, I like that. I can incorporate that. I appreciate the feedback. All right, that's uh, Glenn's presentation. I saw, Millie, you had a hand up at one point. Uh, do you have a question for us? Hey, yes, thank you. Um, so I am in software technology and am also trying to get some new certifications um, in different areas to make myself more marketable as well. So I am trying to balance time spent searching for a job and time spent, um, you know, doing online training to be able to obtain another certification. Just curious on um, any, any thoughts you may have on that area, like amount of time spent in those two areas. I'm kind of trying to do 50, 50, but I feel like I'm spinning my wheels in both areas then. Well, I, I think, you know, that's a really good here. Come grab, hold on. We've got comments here. Yeah, uh, this is Lily Kadoor. Uh, I was going to bring up the uh, same issue or conflict uh, because of my personal experience. Uh, so the 32 hours uh, devoted for uh, the job search may either be split into four each or um, a better way to do it may be to assign uh, particular day only for study another day just for uh, follow up and job search mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. helps so you know I don't have to pull myself away from right. something that I'm if that helps or right. need to add to the 40 hours like at least 10 hours during the week <laughs> then if you have that luxury then yeah that may be yeah. better or which may be, you know, sacrificially, but it's going to pay off, you know that. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My comment too. Um, I have to say it depends. If it's uh if it's quick like a Udemy class that you're you're gonna be able to knock out in one or two days, then jump on that, get it done, especially if it's crucial to getting a, either a toe in the door or getting a particular job. If it's something like a PMP that you're going to have to slog through it for a couple months, that's when you assign just, you know, an hour or two a day, every day, just so you can get through it. But you don't want to just drop out of the job search mode for four or eight weeks while you go through Right, of course. Yeah. And the kind of thing kinds of things I'm doing are kind of right in the middle <laughs> of the PMP and the uh, the couple days. So um yeah. So yeah, I, I'm just kind of balancing and I guess I'll just kind of continue with that. Just wanted to get people's thoughts on if that was a good approach. Cause of course it's valuable, right, to get some more certifications in your field. So um yeah. And it shows that I'm during these few months I've been out of work. You know, I'd like to show that I've done something. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a good point. If it's uh, something real short, I've even postponed applying for the role by a day just because I wanted to get on a LinkedIn learning course. For example, uh, familiarity with Salesforce. Okay, so just take that so that you can exactly. to your resume <laughs> for yeah. your. And that's funny because I'm in the Salesforce field. So those are the certs I'm working on. Hi, Mary. This is Walt. Uh, here's how I would approach this to answer your question. I can't give you a percentage break. First of all, you evidently have a list of goals in your education that you want to accomplish with certifications. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much time 
it takes to accomplish each one of those. And if you've got the amount of time and you can break it down and like into hours or something, mm -hmm. and your priority, when do you want to accomplish those particular certifications? What's your target date for doing that? So now you have your education piece set aside. You know what it looks like to, to accomplish all of that. Now you've got your other side on the job search. One of the biggest factors is when do you do what? During the week where you can talk to people and do things is when you do your job search thing. Your training, you can do a lot more in the evening or perhaps on weekends or early in the morning or late in the afternoons, Mondays and Fridays. Companies don't like to talk to people on Mondays and Fridays a lot. So, but your Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays, I would suggest your heavy and job search activities. And then the other days you can increase your educational activities. What do you think? That that sounds like a good idea um, to, and even just to kind of put a schedule together for myself to see it at the beginning of the week to kind of already know in my head, all right, this is what you're doing. And this is the time you're going to dedicate to job search versus training. Um, I'm not a great planner scheduler. I'm more <laughs> seat of my pants. So I think that that would probably be a very good idea for me. So, yeah, thank you. And accountability call a partner to keep you on schedule. Right, right. <laughs> Questions we can answer for anybody else. One of the things I will also include is uh, when this presentation was done a few years, several years ago, there was a gentleman in our group who took this and he was an Excel guru and expanded the point, not the point system, but he expanded it where he laid out his week where he included time to study the Bible, time to go to church. Uh, and he included all these things and assigned points to his personal life as well as his job search life. So uh, I will include that spreadsheet out there that you can go see. Uh, I think one of the tabs goes month by month by month. It's got, he included sayings. So every time he opened up the spreadsheet, there would be a new motivational saying at the bottom of it. So uh, you'll be able to see all this kind of, you know, people who love Excel, how they can take it to the extreme. And, you know, but once again, this was a great practice tool for him to sort of keep up with his, with his uh, Excel skills. So I will include that also. Anything else, anybody else? I will be sure to include uh, in the email this afternoon, everything we just talked about. Uh, and I'll also include the uh, links to accountability groups. So if you wanna go back and watch that video, in fact, I think, um, yeah, I'll, I'll include that on there. So uh, you, like I said, this is just sort of a starting point you can take it, you can modify it, add whatever you want, assign whatever points you want to assign for personal things for yourself. All right, let me share a few more slides and we will get out of here today. Let's see here. Uh, if you've not put your information in the chat window, please do so. I know that you're going to be, so you're with us. And if you're with us today and I know you're here and I can see your, uh, you know, if I have your email address, I will be sure to get these documents out to you this afternoon. So if you haven't done so, please go ahead and do that. Uh, we will have no session next Friday. Just a reminder, no session next Friday. I'll be sitting home very bored going, why am I not here? But on January 5th, we'll be back together talking about open forum. We'll have to answer any questions you have about your job search. And we want to hear about your favorite Christmas present that you got. So if you are in person, come join us. If, uh, if you're in person, if you're living in the Dallas Fort Worth area, come join us in person. Uh, otherwise, we will be on Facebook and Zoom. Uh, this session has been recorded. You will be able to go back and watch it on the Career DFW Facebook page or the Career USA YouTube channel. On the Career USA YouTube channel, just click on playlist because I've got over 580 videos up there right now. Uh, select the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group speakers where that red circle is. Click on view full playlist and you will see a list of all the different dates and topics. Scroll down to whichever topic it is you like. Accountability groups are in there, but I'll put the link in the uh, email this afternoon. And, um, you know, you can go back and watch. Just remember that the speakers start about 25 to 30 minutes into all these videos for the North Dallas group. Join us today for lunch, 1145 Jason's Deli. You got to have lunch. You got to eat. Um, you know, you got to warm up that belly for that pre-Christmas food. So uh, come join us today. Uh, Jason's Deli, northeast corner of Parker and Preston. 
Thank you for joining us, everybody. Have a very Merry Christmas. If you're traveling, have a very safe travels and uh, Happy New Year. And we will see you all next year. Thank you.